Hello and welcome back to the Step 1 Biochemistry Pathway Series for 12daysinmarch.com where we'll try to focus on the high yield biochemical pathways for the Step 1 boards exam. As always, if you have any questions or comments regarding this or any of our videos, please feel free to reach out to us at 12daysinmarch.com or directly by emailing howard at 12daysinmarch.com. Today we'll be talking about galactose metabolism and as in all of our pathways, we'll try to focus on specific elements of the pathway that will help us navigate our way through questions we're likely to see on our Step 1 exam. Today, the elements we'll be focusing on are where the pathway starts, where the pathway ends, what the goals of the pathway are, what are the key enzymes that will get us from start to end, and what cofactors they need to function, and especially what the key disorders related to these pathways are. Ultimately, we want to figure out how this pathway works in the context of other important biochemical pathways, and at the end we'll summarize with special notes, therapies, and key derivatives that we'll see as a result of galactose metabolism. So highlighting the key elements of galactose metabolism specifically, we'll see that our starting product is galactose, and that we end with glucose 1-phosphate. The overall goal of this pathway is to generate usable energy from a dietary source of sugar, namely galactose. The key enzymes you'll want to remember in this pathway are galactokinase, uridyltransferase, and aldose reductase. Key disorders associated with this pathway are galactokinase deficiency and galactosemia. And we'll see here later that this pathway fits more broadly into pathways for gluconeogenesis and glycolysis. So let's start by looking at the pathway itself. You'll see that there are actually two pathways as the overall scheme of galactose metabolism can run in one of two directions. The primary pathway that we're concerned with today is going to run across the stream from left to right and starts with galactose and ends with glucose 1-phosphate. The secondary pathway, which we'll see becomes a key part of some of our disorders, runs from galactose down the screen to galacticol through the enzyme aldose reductase. But for now, just to get ourselves oriented, let's just focus on the main pathway, which runs again from left to right on the screen. So as we mentioned before, the first product of our pathway is galactose, which is ingested as a dietary sugar. The first step in our pathway is going to involve converting galactose to galactose 1-phosphate through the enzyme galactokinase, which, as we can see here, takes a phosphate from ATP, which will convert it to ADP. What's also important about this step is that this will be the step that allows galactose to enter the cell in the first place by adding the phosphate group, which we'll see has key implications for some of the disorders associated with the galactose metabolism pathway. The second step of our pathway occurs inside the cell and involves a conversion of galactose 1-phosphate to glucose 1-phosphate through the action of the enzyme uridyl transferase. And looking below, you'll see that this step is also dependent on the activity of another enzyme, epimerase, which converts UDP galactose to UDP glucose, but this enzyme isn't often implicated in disease, and so for the purposes of step 1s, it's not necessarily something that we'll need to memorize. So once galactose has ultimately been converted to glucose 1-phosphate, we can see that it plays a role in two key biochemical processes. It can continue to be converted to glucose for the purpose of gluconeogenesis, or it can be metabolized even further in a process of glycolysis which we know produces energy for the cell. So this next slide is just to help us understand the context of this pathway a little bit better. So here we can see in the center of the slide that we have the end product of this pathway, which is glucose 1-phosphate, and how through the enzyme phosphoglucomutase, it becomes converted to glucose 6-phosphate, which as we know is a key intermediate in both glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Now, phosphoglucomutase is not an enzyme that's associated with any pathologies in terms of galactose metabolism, but it is an enzyme that you may hear about in the context of other pathways, specifically how they relate to gluconeogenesis and glycolysis in general. And with this slide, we're essentially just highlighting the fact that the ultimate product of this pathway, which is glucose 6-phosphate, can play a role in either the process of gluconeogenesis by moving up the chain essentially to glucose directly, or it can continue to be metabolized through the process of glycolysis by continuing down the pathway we see here on the right. So in some ways, we've actually already answered our next question, which is, what is the goal of this pathway? So as we've seen by putting our pathway in context, we can see that the overall goal is to take a dietary sugar, which is galactose, and convert it into an intermediate glucose 1-phosphate that can be used to directly generate ATP through the process of glycolysis or to produce glucose for storage, which is the process of gluconeogenesis. And, as with many of our pathways, problems in this pathway arise when enzymes in this pathway are either missing or deficient, leading primarily to an accumulation of dangerous byproducts within the cell. So what are these problems specifically, and how do they present clinically? For the purposes of step one, there are two important conditions that are associated with this pathway, and each one is caused by a deficiency or a loss of one of the key enzymes involved. Despite the fact that we're dealing with the same pathway, these two disorders have vastly different clinical presentations. And because of this, they tend to manifest in a number of different ways. 
Another thing to note here is that each of the disorders is autosomal recessive. So if you have a question that involves everyone in the family through multiple generations with a specific disorder, it's time to start thinking about different pathways because this one is likely not it. So the first disorder we want to talk about is galactokinase deficiency, which as the name suggests is a loss of the first enzyme in the pathway. As we saw earlier, the purpose of galactokinase is to attach a phosphate from ATP to galactose, forming galactose 1-phosphate. The purpose of adding a phosphate is to allow galactose to enter the cell to be further metabolized. So it carries that if galactokinase is missing or deficient, galactose cannot enter the cell. Because galactose can't enter the cells, it remains in the blood and urine where it can be detected on routine testing. And the terms that they use associated with this is galactose found in the blood is galactosemia and galactose found in the urine is called galactosuria. Another implication of galactokinase missing is that we have shut down our primary metabolism pathway, which has the ultimate effect of activating the secondary pathway through the enzyme aldose reductase. So what happens in our secondary pathway as a result of our primary pathway being shut down is that we have an accumulation of galactose that we've seen occurs in the blood and the urine. Because of this, the enzyme aldose reductase will convert some of our excess galactose to galactitol, which at high levels is associated with the formation and development of infantile cataracts, much like sorbitol in diabetics. Now usually this is a disorder that is picked up on routine newborn testing, but if for some reason that testing wasn't done, the way that this disease typically manifests is through the de development of infantile cataracts. And some ways that people typically are triggered to look for this is if a baby doesn't develop a social smile or can't track objects across the midline because they simply can't see due to their cataracts. The second disorder associated with this pathway is called classic galactosemia and involves a deficiency in the enzyme uridyl transferase, also called galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. What this ultimately means is that galactose 1-phosphate cannot be converted to glucose 1-phosphate, which is again the end product of our pathway overall. The ultimate problem here is that because galactokinase, the upstream enzyme, is intact, having uridyl transferase be knocked out allows galactose 1-phosphate to accumulate inside the cell, which ultimately results in significant damage to hepatocytes. At the same time, galactokinase, which as we mentioned is outside the cell, is still functioning at high capacity, which is endlessly burning precious ATP in the process. Despite this, there is still some accumulation of galactose outside the cell, which, as we saw before, activates our secondary pathway and leads to accumulation of galactitol, which, as we recall, leads to development of infantile cataracts. So when we combine these effects, we can see that the clinical manifestations of this process are related to damage of hepatocytes due to accumulation of galactose 1-phosphate, as well as accumulation of galactitol, which combined typically present with infantile cataracts, intellectual disability, hepatomegaly, jaundice, and general failure to thrive. So now that we've seen our two key disorders, let's talk about treatment and some general tricks and tips for remembering these disorders. Treatment for either disorder just involves avoiding dietary galactose and lactose, which ultimately gets broken down to glucose and galactose. In the United States, these disorders are usually picked up on a newborn screen. So it's useful to think about these disorders if in a question stem you hear about a baby who has recently emigrated from another country or who for whatever reason has missed their newborn screens. The real difficulty in trying to think about these disorders is remembering which disorder is associated with which enzyme. The key to remembering this is that the main difference in clinical picture between these two disorders is due to damage to hepatocytes. As a general principle, sugars need phosphate to enter cells. Kinases add these phosphates. So it logically follows that if you have no kinase or a kinase is knocked out, you won't see passage into cells and therefore can't damage the cells. Galactosemia is associated with loss of one of these kinases, so it's called galactokinase deficiency, and therefore can't damage hepatocytes. Therefore, if we're thinking about this pathway and we're dealing with a baby that is not clinically very ill, it means that we've likely lost the galactokinase and the disorder we're most likely dealing with is galactosemia. And just another way to remember this is that with galactosemia, I'm just not galactosemia, and that's because I have infantile cataracts and just infantile cataracts, which is a horrible pun. And just for reference here, we've added our main goals of this pathway, and we've summarized them with some of the answers that we've been through. And so if you want to use this slide for reference or print it out as a flashcard, that might be a good way to start after you watch these videos. And that's all we have for galactose metabolism. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to leave them on YouTube or to contact us directly by emailing howard at 12daysinmarch.com.